KMF Radio, presented by the Sound Museum Boston. We are live. Young Jerks. Back. Together. Running a little bit late. Just a little bit, but you know what? You know we were coming, though. Good things come to those who wait. Yeah. Building it up. Absolutely. You got a heck of a show coming today. Well, that's why. We're getting ready for it. You know? Getting prepared. And there's uh, some snow on the ground and a big blizzard coming to Boston, Cambridge area. Woohoo! On Monday and Tuesday. A little bit today and, you know, tonight. Like dusting. It's nice, though. It's good for the kids. Finally. Absolutely. But uh, we are the Young Jarks. You know who I am. I am Mike Ann, and he is... Frank Capone. Howdy. And Howdy, yeah. It's like back first in uh, three weeks that we were actually back together. Yep. We, we both rarely miss shows, and we both uh, kind of covered for each other the last couple strings, weeks, you know? which was pretty... It's nice to be back together. Yeah, back together, back together. Once again, I'm not going to start singing. Nobody wants to hear I know. That. We can sing with... Uh, <laughs> we'll do the Onyx uh, back together with Mr. DL later. <laughs> we'll, we'll actually play the track behind us so we don't sound so bad. Nice. But we have a big show. We have someone uh, patiently uh, listening, uh, someone that we're very excited to speak to today. We also he- have Healthy Heady Lifestyle in the studio. We're going to talk about a lot of the uh, things later uh, that are happening at the State House that, you know, what we cover, the le- legislation beat, and uh, some of the issues that we've been covering, some big news happening with uh, the new Senate president, uh, with the governor of Massachusetts, and some of the things that we've talked about in the past with uh, the challenge we had with the governor. Yeah. A lot of news happening related to that. We will get to that today. So people, uh, you know, definitely do stay tuned for that in the second half of the show. But first, we wanted to get to the big guest. Uh, we have a gentleman who is an award winning investigative uh, journalist. He is uh, the founder of a, a very interesting website that people should check out and support, I believe. Uh, he, you know, it's great work. Who, what, why, dot com. Uh, they're a nonprofit investigative journalism, which I really like. Uh, they don't, uh, pander to anyone except to the people who are contributing, which are hopefully, uh, people who are interested in getting real news, real backed up, you know, by facts. He's, uh, you know, he worked for, you know, I still think he does write for some of these people once in a while. He, maybe he can tell us about that. But New York Times, Washington Post, Village Voice, Esquire, and many others. He's written uh, a book that's got two dis- different editions. The latest edition, as far as I know, is uh, Family of Secrets, The Bush Dynasty, America's Visible, Invisible Government in the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years, which is my viewpoint in the world. Like everything he writes, I'm like, wow, why, this is the stuff that I always shake my head on and say, look at these documented facts. And no Doesn't one talks anyone about see it. this? Doesn't yeah. anyone else see this? So he, we're very honored to have him. Uh, Ross Baker, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. Absolutely. Thank you for coming applause, man. Okay. Who's doing that applauding? That's we, uh, my can, is it? Yeah, that's my can, <laughs> Frank Capone. Holly is also here. Say hello, yes, Holly. Hello, how are you? And, oh, hi, Holly. Nice to, nice to hear you. We got a full studio. There's some other folks here as well. And, uh, Russ, we want to get right into it. Um, the Boston bombing, you guys have been covering this so well, who, what, why, dot com. So much information uh, that you guys, just in your couple days coming into Boston, into Harvard, I mean, into uh, MIT, investigating just simply the Sean Collier murder that happened right next to my house. Like I was there that night after like a half hour, hour after he was shot. And, uh, it, it just following the whole thing with the scanners that night and being in the middle of this lockdown, it bothers me that we still know nothing about this. And what we find out is through you, not the, uh, not the Boston globe and not the New York times. It's through you, your, your little, your little outfit. Why is that? What, what is going on with the Sean Collier thing, first of all? What have you found out? Tell people, well, well, first of all, let me say that the reason I started Who, What, Why, our nonprofit, nonpartisan news site, is because I got fed up with this kind of thing happening again and again. In the course of decades of working in mainstream journalism, I saw that when there was a big, big event, let's call it a big trauma, uh, involving powerful uh, interests and the uh, security state and what have you, there always seemed to be this tremendous pressure for everybody to get in line. And there would be almost instantaneously a statement that the authorities have solved the thing and everybody line up and start waving your flags and you know repeating what you're told. And we know from experience that large institutions and certainly government outfits like the FBI uh, and so forth uh, have a less than stellar track record when it comes to leveling with us. 
And yet we forget that every time. Every time we start over again and they say, okay, uh, you know, you go back to the Kennedy assassination with Lee Harvey Oswald, they were almost instantly saying that they had solved it. And as anybody who's co- followed that over the years and read the, the many terrific books on that subject know that that's a much more complicated subject and there are real doubts uh, about the official story. And uh, so our society is divided between those of us who hear the official story and accept it and think it's crazy to question it, and those of us who dig in and who question. And so with the Boston bombing here, uh, uh, what, what struck me was, was how quickly uh, they began saying to us, the whole thing's solved, nothing to see here, folks, move along, move along. And I thought, wow, that is really fast. And we began looking at it, at who, what, why. And one of the things that interested me, as you said, was the shooting of Officer Collier. And it's very interesting to me to hear from you that you live right there and that you were on the scene shortly thereafter. I uh, hope we can talk about it. I'd love to hear, hear what you know. Um, but I can tell you this much. Um, the story about what happened to Officer Sean Collier changed. And it changed yeah. a number of times. And what the public thinks, and in fact, those people who yes. are uh, being considered to be on the jury, what they think happened there is probably not even what the authorities ended up uh, admitting or claiming uh, later on. And so, you know, there's a saying, there are various iterations from Churchill and so forth. Mark, uh, Mark, uh, sorry, Mark Twain uh, is, is uh, supposedly said that uh, a lie gets around the world before the truth can get its pants on. Yeah, that retraction about uh, the gun, like the, the whole thing the, immediately. Oh, they shot this guy to steal his gun. <laughs> well, then no, they, no, later let's, on, let's go back uh, to the beginning. Uh, we were first told that Officer Sean Collier died in the line of duty when confronting. Oh yeah, that's right. I've the Boston about that one. bombing terrorists. That's right. That's what we were told. I'm and that's yep. why that's why there's a beer named after him. That's why there's a what a 10k run and t-shirts and clubs. That's why they filled a stadium. Are you ready for this? They filled a stadium. And the vice president of the United States came out, and it was all these people cheering for this guy. And I have to say, I feel bad that he died. And I feel bad that any police officer died. In fact, I feel bad that anybody at all dies. But the fact of the matter is they don't do this guy a favor or his memory or his family to lie about the circumstances of his death. How, how does that serve any useful purpose uh, except some ulterior motive that has nothing to do with the truth uh, or with even the, the common decency of being honest with his family? And so the first story was that he confronted these guys. At a at a at a convenience store. Remember that? Yes, uh, yes. He he, he stopped, tried to stop them, and they shot him. Okay, that was the first story. Then the story after you know ninety percent of the people were no longer paying attention. They said, oh no no. Um, it wasn't at a convenience store. It was on the campus of MIT. And now you still have the impression maybe he tried to stop them on the campus of MIT. But then it changed again. And this time, it wasn't that it was that he tried to stop them. It was that they tried to get his gun. Okay, so they tried to get his gun. Now, where was he parked? Hmm. So we are first told that he was parked on the street. Okay? Uh, I mean, if you want, we could talk about which street and so on. I'm sure your listeners know all these streets. But anyway, uh, and I, I live in New York, so I had to come up there and look at the map and start from scratch. But anyway, we were told he was parked on the street, and these guys came up and shot him. After I start looking into the thing, I find out that the police chief claimed that he, why, because I was wondering, why was he even sitting in his car, right? It's nighttime, MIT, there's nobody around, uh, and it's just, it's just strange, and they've, they've issued these, by, by that time of night, on that Thursday of the, the week of the, of the Boston Marathon bombing, they said that, uh, he had been, um, uh, remember five o'clock or whatever the FBI put up those videos, yes. the stills, you know, these two they guys in the backpacks. Were. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Right? Yes, I do. So, so, so then, so we know that they're looking for these guys. And I guess the city, it certainly is tense. And there's this, I guess, MIT police officer sitting in his car. Now, why is he sitting in his car? Here's the story we were told by the police chief. He says he was sitting in his car to prevent people from making illegal right turns through the MIT campus. Now, First of all, I started thinking, who makes an illegal right turn late at night through a campus that's abandoned? So I don't get why you do that. So then I went and looked, and I said, do you, what do you save, five miles by doing that? The answer is no, you save about 100 feet. 
because if you're going down that street where you can turn right, there's a there's a, a street light there. <laughs> and so you would just turn right at the street light. So guess what I find? He wasn't parked on the street at all. He was parked by the Stata Center. Do you guys know that? Yeah, I do. The new building. The, the uh, new the, building. The, the, the modern Stata one. Center. The yeah. civil one. Yeah. Yeah, he's parked by the Stata Student Center. Up Center. on whatever, the co- I don't remember, the cobblestones or something. Yeah, I know exactly I, what you're talking about. Between two, it's two like buildings, wedged right? wedged between buildings. Now yeah. you're going to tell me that people make illegal right turns late at night on an abandoned campus between buildings on an elevated curb to avoid a street light that's I mean, a, a traffic light that's, you know, yards ahead. I mean, yeah, you got to go up and into a one-way. <laughs> There's no one there. It's, it's a it's farce. It's totally bizarre. Yeah. Now, listen to this. Do you know that, that nobody in all of the media, as far as I know, the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, all your fabulous NPR stations, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah, blah the, the progressive, this and that, not a single one of any of these news organizations in Boston, anywhere in the United States, or anywhere in the world, has thought that this was interesting at all. All they wanted to do was report about, you know, the Officer Collier 10K run. And the the hero, yeah. 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 So I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word on the radio, and if not, I apologize. That's fine. It's okay? okay. We'll let you slide we, on that yeah, one. we don't like swearing, but that one is okay. Okay, good. That's okay. Heck, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What <laughs> anyway, what the heck? You know, the whole story doesn't make any sense. So I said something is really, really strange here. And I go on the campus and I start talking to students and I say, Have you ever seen a car cut through the campus at night? You know, have you seen a car go by this building? Whatever? And they're like, No, why would anybody do that? And, and do you know that I get an email, a phone call and an email from a vice president at MIT telling me to stop coming on campus and asking questions because I'm upsetting people. I do believe it. I mean, it's just uh, they, they, you know, they don't want any inquiry that's not uh, that's off the reservation. <laughs> well, that's because it tears down the hero, right? I mean, because that's the whole point of this is to, is to build that that hero well, figure. And, and, and I think a lot of times, uh, you know, this uh, law enforcement tells them to shut up, to not talk to the media, to uh, let them handle it, right, Russ? That's correct. They are told to shut up. Uh, and it's also just general policy because all these big universities have large donors are very sensitive about things and so forth, and they don't want anything controversial. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is that somebody was killed, and this could be germane to the investigation sure. of the largest terrorist attack on a U.S. soil since 9-11. I mean, I don't see how it's not important to an institution of higher learning uh, to learn something. Yeah, it's so bizarre. I mean, there's so many of these inconsistencies, and I love what you did, too, um, looking at all the stories that you've been covering. You know, the fact, I, I knew this for a long time, but I didn't know how it was really happening, and you explain it. It's so obvious when you read the news and see it, but you explained it, how, like, all of a sudden, all this information is coming out in the media, but there's no source. It's all rumor from law enforcement. No one claims anything, and then it's taken back and walked back and changed, and no one admits it. It's always uh, leaked in the beginning to favor the law enforcement side, and it's this FBI guy. Uh, he used to work for the FBI. Now he works in the media, or supposedly. <laughs> who knows who he's working with? I mean, you, you revealed this, that this is the way the media is now working. They're getting all the information from one FBI agent, and that's basically what we know about this whole Sarnoff case in the Boston media. Is that correct? Russ? That's, that's right. You have to look at this whole case as this remarkable hologram. It's a hologram. Almost everything we think we know doesn't hold up. And I just want to say something. I am not saying that the Tsarnaev brothers did not do something, did not commit a crime. Maybe they built a bomb. Maybe they, you know, I don't know. But all I can tell you is what we were told does not hold up. Sure. And the fact that it doesn't hold up, and the fact that we're not allowed to ask about this, who, what, why, our website, we've gone to uh, the, the, the Cambridge police and the Boston police and the Middlesex County. Are you guys in middle? Is that right? Middle, is, it, is Cambridge in Middlesex? I believe so. Yeah, Middlesex, Middlesex County, yeah, right? Middlesex. Okay, and, and then the county, Boston is in whatever county. Suffolk. I live in Suffolk. Yeah, Suffolk, yeah. 
You know, and then they all say we can't comment because it's an ongoing investigation. Um, and then, you know, the FBI never comments on these things. So, like, nobody will talk, but they, but they talk, as you pointed out. They leak. They leak all this stuff. And the, the, the Boston media and the national media just takes all these freebies because they love it because it's, you know, stories, it's content that, you know, uh, sources who, you know, asked that their name not be used told us this and this and this and this. Well, none of that stuff, practically none of it, uh, checks out. And and so this whole Collier thing, you know, and then what did they do? Why did they shoot him? They this guy was supposedly sitting in his car. They come up to him and they shoot him in the head. He doesn't even see them. I mean, you know, now you got a question, uh why would they kill him? You know, it paints them out to be of course homicide idol maniacs, right? And it, and it, and it, it, you know, because what was the evidence that they committed the Boston bombing? All I've seen is a video of two kids walking with backpacks and a sea of people walking with backpacks. So we've never, you see, we think we were shown some evidence, but we weren't. We were never shown any evidence that they did it. The, um, the bomb experts say it would have been quite difficult for these kids with what we think was their level of technical expertise to have actually built something like that. Um, we don't really know them to have harbored uh, any apparent animosity uh, toward the United States. They, they told us that uh, uh, there was a story put out that Tamara and Sarnayev hated America and had no American friends. Guess who his friends were? Americans. Guess who his wife was? This blonde girl from Connecticut whose you know, father and grandfather or whatever were in skull and bones. I mean, honest. Graham, yeah, Graham. That's right? convenient. Was yeah. her last name Russell or Graham or something like that? Or was Russell, it Russell? Yeah, Russell. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like a very yeah. common, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, w- little theme. Uh, how do I say it? Like almost like a Brahmin name, I guess. Yeah. Like a Yelly. His, his uncle, listen, his uncle lived in Virginia and was married to the daughter of the head of CIA operations in, you know, Chechnya and the southern flank of the Soviet Union. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. That it was just, the Graham Fuller guy, isn't that it? Yeah, yeah. Graham Fuller, yeah. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, these are, the, these are the things you never hear. Yeah. You know, I, I, other than Who, What, Why, our website, I mean, I don't know where, where you know, there's a little bit of stuff people posted on the Internet, but but honestly, did you hear this on CBS, you know? No. Did you, no. Did you, read, did you read this in the in the Washington Post, you know? I mean... Maybe mention buried a uh, hundred pages in. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> at the bottom. One. Yeah. So one Russ, time. so you so you you just started to talk about um, you know Chechnya and and the CIA and and I wanted to get more into what you understand have, have learned about how the FBI and the Sarnev brothers uh, interacted with one another in terms of when the first touch was was there like a handling situation going on there. If you right. I mean, on I mean the, the narrative is, is you know, the bombing happens on Monday, April 15, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, very tense, a lot of, of course, a lot of coverage, uh, Thursday, nothing, and then suddenly around, don't hold me to this, but 5 o'clock or something, they break into whatever you're watching and they say, uh, you know, newsflash, we're going live to, you know, FBI press conference in Boston, and then, boom, there's the FBI and there's a screen up there, and there are these uh, shots of these two guys with the backpacks, and they say, these are, uh, uh, you know, what are they called, figures of interest, you know, um, uh, does any, if anybody can identify these people, we would like to hear from you, which implies they don't know who they are, obviously. So immediately, who pops up but the Russian government, and they say, wait a minute, <laughs> we know who they are, and you know who they are, because we told you that we were concerned that these guys were some kind of a terrorist threat uh, because they were involved in some stuff that we were tracking. And we told you, and you knew about it. Well, now the FBI is stuck, you see, because, <laughs> oh, whoops, uh, we knew the, uh, the, the, the terrorists. We already knew them. You know? So then they had, were forced to admit, well, yes, the Russians did tip us off, and we checked them out, and, you know, they didn't seem to be terrorists. But, of course, when I started looking at it, how did they check them out? This is this is an example of high level tradecraft. They they went to their house and they knocked on the door and they said, "Hi, we're from the FBI. Are you guys terrorists?" Again, you can't make this stuff up. And they said they weren't. They asked the neighbors, "Any indications that you these guys are terrorists?" No. <laughs> you know, okay, thank you very much. And supposedly, after a little bit of keep an eye on them, they they dropped the whole thing. So. That's the cover story. But the the problem is that the FBI has a long history 
of cultivating informants. CIs, confidential informants. We cover this um, all the time on the show. It's, it's CIs, so, yeah. there you go, confidential there you go. informants. And, and particularly among several groups of people, all of whom are what? Susceptible or vulnerable. Because if they try to get you or me to, to, we'll say to, F you. to <laughs> buy on our friends, we're yeah. not going to do it. Exactly. Right? But if they go to somebody who they've got something on them, either because the person's being prosecuted or threatened with prosecution, or because they are what they're they're an immigrant of a or certain a terrorist, status. yeah, a terrorist list, or they want like uh, you know, look at uh, Tamalin wanted immigration status. He wanted to become a citizen. That's something that the FBI, to me, in a meeting would say, hey. You want to work with us? Maybe you get your your your, your uh, citizen yeah, green card. And and who knows? This is what I mean. I I think with uh, Tamalin, then he got in trouble with his wife, and maybe his citizenship was taken away, and he got mad at the FBI because they weren't going to pull the string for him. I mean, that's what I wonder. Maybe maybe that's why he went off. I mean, there's so many ways that they could be covering this up. So many different theories that you could go to. But what I like what you do, Russ, is you just pick a pot with the facts. You go right at them. You don't tell us what happened. You show us facts and then let us figure it out and let everyone else figure it out. Um, Waltham triple murder. That's a big one that we like to talk about here because there's also the same type of backstory where the FBI indicated that uh, Tamalin and uh, Toda Chef were responsible after they shot and killed Toda Chef. Um, and now they're saying differently with uh, the new trial, uh, with the trial right now going on, and it won't help them to say that now. What do you know about that murder? And uh, Well, I, I, look, first of all, I can tell you that I became familiar with it when they started invoking it as another. You see, these are all... These are all prejudicing the public and creating an inexorable force for a rapid conclusion of this case and an end to... Uh, scrutiny of what actually happened, of what the FBI was doing. That's what they're looking for. They want to wrap the whole thing up. So if they can create this huge, it's it's kind of like you know in the old South when they'd said that some a black person had lynched, you know, had raped a white girl. You know, it was like boom, the whole thing just, you know, what I mean, the the energy just took over the town, and there was a mob with the pitchforks and the, you know, the the torches, and the whole thing was over, right? you know, frontier justice. And that's the whole mentality here on this Boston thing, was that they wanted to say, if you're not sure whether these two kids with the backpacks did it, they shot a cop, because people hate that, right, obviously. And, then and, and, you know, that's the second thing. And now they got the third thing, and they triple homicide. Now they're, like, spectacularly uh, 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 murderous to, to another whole uh, multiple, multiplication factor okay uh and so and so that became a big deal and not just that they had it would triple murder but of their friends do you see what i'm saying yeah they're they're making them more and more and more diabolical and then not just of their friends but then they they flaunted the whole thing by what supposedly you know strewing money and and, and pouring uh uh drugs over the, the the corpses you know and and murdered them in this particularly brutal way you know i have to say i mean when i looked at, at that at that homicide i said how do you even do that i mean you know, uh, it, it, how do you get, how do you murder multiple people like that and, and, and successfully, and, and you probably know more details than I do, you know, the way that they supposedly slit their throats or something, makes you wonder whether they wouldn't have had to sort of drug them first or, or something. Well, what about uh, this? What, what if they were a police officer? What if they walked in with a badge on? Because, you know, there was another big drug gang that got busted and that they've been investigating for over 10, 15 years the, uh, through Montreal. Um, and there was a federal trial, the trial before the Sarnoff case, where some of them have gone to jail. And not for that as long as I thought they would have. And they had tapes. They had phone conversations of murders that happened. And... uh you know, the, they had police officers. They had a Watertown police officer that got busted telling these guys who the rats were. Mm -hmm. You wonder yeah. if, if it wasn't some police officers that walked up on these three kids, and maybe mm -hmm. that's why they were subdued so easily. You know, a lot of these stories become very, very complicated because there's lot. There could be lots of different strands, and right. there could be lots of different people and institutions exactly. protecting their own interest. As you said, you know, MIT is protecting its interest, right? And uh, uh, you know, if somebody was not where they were supposed to be at a certain time, they start covering that up. Yep. You see, and so it compounds and compounds and compounds. And if there is God 
forbid some kind of uh, corruption within a police department. Not that we've ever heard of such a thing. Yeah. Um, over and over know. here. And it's <laughs> all these, over and over. Yeah, in yeah, Watertown, you know, Boston, Boston you know, New York used to be famous. Yeah. But Boston has sort of been historically famous for those kind of problems. They have a drug evidence locker thing going on in Boston right now that no one ever got to the bottom of where, you know, I heard this on the street for you. You know how you hear things, Ross, and no one wants to talk because they're afraid. Um, I know people who went into this this place that they're now reporting in mainstream media. Uh, this evidence locker in Boston, where people actually walked in and got drugs from the police, from the evidence, and then all of a sudden they figured out, oh, it's been the the cocaine's been cut. <laughs> yeah, and they brought in this new police chief, Ed Davis, who was going to clean it up and talk to big game, but they reassigned a couple people. A couple guys got suspended for a few days. I mean, it was no one went to jail. There was no real investigation. A joke. This is Boston. I mean, this has gone on for decades. It's like you had your fun. All right, shut it down, guys. You yeah. guys, you guys had your fun. Yeah, it's time to close it down. But they don't, don't you do think that it's anymore, amazing though. that given that kind of history, that the public and the local media have responded so in lockstep on this bombing thing that I there know. is it's... no healthy uh, and you know balanced sort of skepticism or at least curiosity or a hunger for additional information it drives and me even crazy. worse than that yeah. Yeah. to attack to attack exactly. those who would like to ask more questions right. it's so true and we know why Ross we know why because this is the why I'm not at the Boston Globe of the Herald because I won't sacrifice it you know it's because they want to keep their job they you know I look at someone like Dan Ray at WBZ who went up against the FBI who helped free somebody who was innocent who was framed uh, part of the whole Whitey Bulger thing but Dan Ray always toes the line 99% of the time, Dan Ray at WBZ Radio, for instance, toes the line. They all do. Even, you know, they have these one moment, and I don't get it, and that's what I don't get. It's like, how can you see that, Dan Ray? You saw what happened, but then you uh, believe everything the FBI tells you from then on out, apparently. And then you'll say, oh, well, uh, I'm, I'm uh, and, uh, you know, I don't love the FBI, blah, 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 blah. But then he repeats everything they say. Yeah, the problem is you have to pick your battles, and, and it's because we're all sort of... Uh, no, I, got, I don't know if this is a bad word. You're, we're sucking at the teeth of the establishment all the time. That's two. <laughs> yeah. That's it, it. I mean, that is so it. And that's why I love uh, what you're doing, or who, what, why, dot com. Org. Yeah, and dot org. Yeah, right? You have the two different websites, Russ? Yeah, we use dot org because we're um, we're we're a uh, we're a nonprofit. But it, you go to either of those places and you'll get to us. So, Russ, so in terms of like evidence that you've been able to uncover looking into the Boston Marathon bombings. Any semblance of like dash cam footage from when the chase was going on and the, the Sarno brothers were supposedly throwing pipe bombs out their windows, you know, at the police. Any, any... Isn't, it, isn't it weird? Nothing has surfaced about that. I remember going out to Watertown and canvassing the neighborhood and knocking on people's doors. And admittedly, it was just the efforts of a early evening one day when the time that I thought people should be home, but I was unable to find anybody who could actually tell me that, I mean, first of all, they didn't see anything because they were <laughs> supposed to be hiding in their houses, not, you know, sticking their head out the window. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, so the people there didn't really see anything. What did, so what did they have? They heard a lot of shooting and, you know, explosions or what have you. Um, so isn't that interesting? I mean, where is the yeah? Where is the police footage of that? I yeah. mean, you know, you, you you would think, by the way, that that a proper defense of um, uh, uh, Johar Tsarnaev would address all of these things. By the way, that's another really compelling issue. Who, what, why? Our website. We have uh, a whole team of people working on the story. We got a guy uh, in the trial all the time. Um, I'll be there on and off and you know we're trying to look at this stuff but it but but you know the, the thing is the, uh, the 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 defense does not seem to actually be as far as we can tell really uh, uh having been able to put resources into investigating what actually happened in other words they're not they're not journalists and they're not investigators they're the defense uh what does that mean it means that their job is to try to figure out what they can accomplish 
and succeeded at that. And so all the indications are that they've just concluded that it's just hopeless uh, to try to really, um, you know, overcome this tremendous uh, uh, onslaught. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and to just sort of not even bother trying I mean, to figure out what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like how can you blame them? Because when you see this jury poll, we see it, what they say, 99.9% are like, oh, he's guilty, I want to kill him. Oh, uh, it would be really cool to be on this jury. My friends think it would be cool to, to convict this guy. I mean, this is what people say. People have already decided, um, and you know, it's 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 just crazy what what is happening. And and I think that you're right. I think their whole thing is uh, on the appeal that they're just hoping that they can just uh, save the kid's life, maybe on appeal because of the jury pool, <laughs> you know, some legal precedents like that. But it's just, uh, you know, Russ. The other thing too is, uh, you know, we could go on and on about this Boston bombing, um, but you know, there are other things too. Like you you've covered uh, the Bush family for. You know, you wrote these bo- this book, Family of Secrets. What do you think about uh, the brother Bush? Do you think he's going to be, you know, like, the, looking at the history, is uh, is it ordained that he's going to be the next one. president? Is, that, is this what's happening now? I mean, uh, there's no question that Jeb Bush wants to run. There's no question that the family is behind him. And uh, as you know from my book, Family of Secrets, when the family is behind him, it's not the, the family. It's a, it's a whole sector of the one percent of the one percent that want this guy in there, you know the, the the third generation of the family, they want a real royal dynasty and what they represent. And of course, the media is already failing in its job. Now they're trying to. to George, Jeb isn't George; is a different kind of a guy. <laughs> uh, different, yeah. Okay. So, um, so what's going on there is that look, he starts. You can say whatever you want to say about where he looks in the polls, but he starts with a tremendous advantage. I mean, huge name recognition. Uh, um, a certain uh, nostalgia, believe it or not, for that family and a kind of a growing thing with the media participating, kind of whitewashing, um, softening the edges on the brother with the fact that he has now become an artist. Uh, and the grandfather, uh, rather the father, uh, who uh, you know left office with fairly bad poll numbers, couldn't get reelected, you know, they're sort of re- rehabilitating him. Uh, and then, you know, they always do that. The public swings up and back. And once they get tired after they finish vilifying Obama as, you know, the socialist from hell, uh, then they're going to want to swing back to something else. And there's Jeb there. So I think he's got a tremendous chance. And I think we, we, yeah. we have a real, you know, like a 50-50 shot of becoming uh, the first time in this country to have three generations of the same family in the White House. That's crazy. Um, let me ask you um, one more question, go back to the Boston bombing thing. Um, that night when uh, Sean Colley got, got uh, murdered, um, I did go out there to the scene of the crime. I, I saw a Facebook post about someone had been shot right there, police, so I went out because it was right near, next to my house. So I went out there. The uh, police were like pointing guns at us. Like There was journalists there. Fox News was there. I saw that... Uh, one of the dudes, Jesse, nah, uh, actually, I forget his name. One of the dudes from Fox News I always see on there, he was there. But there was a bunch of media there. And the police from all different places, there was the ATF, there was the FBI, there was Homeland Security, there were local police. They had machine guns out, and they were pointing them at the local police, telling us to get back over the railroad tracks. Uh, they pushed us back. So I went to back to my house. I just said, forget about this. It was like we were under martial law for like three or four days. The helicopters were just flying over my house for four days. And... um one of the things I went back and people were like, listen to the scanners. So we were listening to the scanners that night. And I saw this come up later, and Frank brought some of these things up too, is about that chase with no tapes, no real tapes. Um, there's a lot more we could get into. We don't have that much time. But we could talk about uh, um, when Sarnoff, the younger Sarnoff got caught in the boat and all that stuff. But what I want to focus on is just to ask you a quick, there, on the scanner, I heard, Police saying, and you don't know who the police were saying this, you don't know who's on the scanner line, but they were saying, state police SUV is stolen. We are following a state police. They're throwing bombs at us. They said all this crazy stuff. It was a state police SUV. And then later on, it was reported that that state police SUV might have run off, run over the elder Sarnoff. Have you looked into this? Do you have any information? whether Because it was never reported really after that. It's not in the official thing. Was there ever any news about a state police SUV? I remember also hearing that. Um, we don't have any more information on it. All I can say is this. At who, what, why, uh, we are continuing to look at all this stuff. We've got a 
team of people looking at it. There are so many angles. This angle is very important. I want to be clear. There are many, many crucial angles that have not been explored. We're trying to do what we can. The problem is, and I'm sorry to do a pitch here, but we're a small Money. A nonprofit organization. We can only do this stuff based on public donations and you know we want to put more people on this thing and we want to follow up on these things so we welcome support uh, you can do it at our website uh, who what why dot org uh, and also we welcome tips uh, if if you, as you were you know if you were around and you saw something if you were listening to a scanner uh, if you've got uh, uh, friends or relatives in law enforcement who have told you things or know things uh, if you've got particular talents that you might be able to offer uh, technical expertise and so forth. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you. And if you go to whowhatwhy.org, uh, there's a contact link there, and you can get in touch with us. Perfect. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely. We'll post that and make sure it's out there too. Check that out. I actually was checking out the the website earlier today, and uh, I found a lot of really inf- interesting information. And just you know, like Mike was saying, the way that it's just laid out. It's facts. It's stuff that, you know, this is what happened. Make a decision from there, you know. And in terms of that, I, I was um, checking out um, one of your um, talks that you had, had given uh, earlier today. And you had mentioned at one point uh, about 22 other plots uh, that were going, that were a possibility to happen um, as per the FBI uh, during the, the Boston bombing. There was, there was a, a number of different scenarios that could have played out. And I was curious as to, like, how you came across, like, how, how did you come across that information? Like, how, how do you, like, know exactly, like, what, what they were going to do, you know, in terms of, like, these different options, these different plots or terrorist attacks? Oh, that's, I mean, the government identifies these things. One of the key things you have to understand is that the, this, you know, we already had the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about. It was turned into this giant money machine, okay, giant, and to this day, all those places, MIT, Harvard, and stuff, they all make money off of the state of sort of perpetual war. fear and war, yeah. uh, and that was a huge apparatus. And then came 9-11, and you now have a second apparatus, right? It wasn't enough that we had to go abroad to fight the bad guys, now we've got to fight oh. them on our own soil. So now you've got a double you know, money machine, okay? So it, this thing has to be fed. And, and as far as these, these enterprises, I mean, obviously if a police department, if there's no crime, how is that good for them? You know? Bad, yeah. I mean, if nobody's committing crimes, there's nothing for them to do. Yeah, the FBI and so on and so on, they've got to all prove what they're doing and they go in and they testify uh, before Congress and they present reports to the president on, you know, here's what's happening. And they say things like there were X number of plots. So that's their number that there were 22 uh, purported, you know, terrorist plots. But then, if you look at, you know, when they're pressed to uh, reveal uh, how they know about it, it turns out in 19 of them, uh, there was an FBI informant in the middle of the thing. Who instigated and, it? Who set it up? Well, that, I mean, that's, that's the whole that's, point. Yeah. It, was it was <laughs> the mean, FBI <laughs> informant revealing the yeah, plot, or was uh, the FBI informant causing the plot? Exactly. And that's what they do. They find, like you said, they find the patsies, the people who are too dumb to say no. I mean, you can, you know, when I, I used to do sales, I still, you know, Frankie and I are both salespeople. You can, you know, you can be unethical in sales. A lot of people are unethical. Oh, yeah. You can find the person that uh, has no brain that will say yes to anything. You can overcome, you know, push people really hard. Yeah. I mean, it works at times. That's not the type of sales I ever wanted to do. Right. Yeah, no. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> but, you know, this is what the FBI agents are doing. They're, they're finding well, let's the person. talk about let's talk about uh, Tamerlan Sarnayev. Yeah. I mean, this was a guy who loved being American, uh, and um, uh, and then suddenly he has this personality change, and he's going into these mosques and he's kind of loudly, you know, sort of swaggering, you know, as a kind of a comic book, you know, Islamic fundamentalist, and and he's you know, and then he goes back. He travels to the former Soviet Union, where he's doing it over there. He's, you know, he's like trying to incite people. And even I think it's like some relative of his who's who is, you know, a a devout, you know, Muslim, Muslim, maybe. 
quasi fundamentalist. Sure. And he, they, even the, that guy's like, "What yeah. is with you? Yeah. You, know, you need to go back to America." America. You know, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, and and so you ha- you know you have to wonder why would somebody change like that? And as you point out, this is right in the period where he's trying to get the U.S. to give him a passport. And and we know the FBI is going in and out of his house, uh, and. Also, if, by the way, at who, what, why dot org, you can uh, just you know look at our series on Boston Marathon bombing, and you can read a piece uh, where we uh, go through a a report by the inspectors general of all of these agencies looking at this thing, and they say that when he went to Russia, uh, they the um, you know the FBI knew about it, and you know that the the authorities the uh, the border authorities were alerted to that, but that when he came back. Somebody had instructed yeah. them to take the flag yeah, down. Yeah, let them go. Don't pay any attention to this guy. Yeah, they turned off the alarm. Basically, it's kind That's of like what they uh, did. there was That's a right. flag they and they off said, the alarm yep. just before the burglar came in. Yep. They're like, let him go, let him through, and you know that happens all the time in law enforcement. We call that uh, what do we call it? Controlled delivery in the in the drug trade. I mean, what, they do what is it fast called? and fu- controlled delivery. I believe it controlled is controlled delivery. And then there's like the fast and furious. They did it right. They let the guns go. The yep. gun walking. Like, I mean, oh, these. Yeah, you, this you is this this is a proven tactic because you know you like you said earlier you uh you you got to have the crime so the law enforcement has a reason um you know with the first uh, world trade center attack the bombs didn't go off the right way or whatever it, would, it wasn't a big enough explosion but look at the fbi's involvement in that yeah i know and, you know they they, they recorded on they tape. can't stop it they can't stop it because if they stop it people will think it's not real so they gotta let it happen and then they can <laughs> say we were right there we were just about to stop it well but, that's the thing like russ how much uh, do you think all of this is is like the hegelian dialectic like, how much do you think all of this is, is really like, like that, in your opinion? You know, look, all I can tell you is uh, that, you know, a vacuum creates, a vacuum must be filled. And um, one has to be careful in, when one talks about this, because I don't want to give the wrong impression. I do believe that we have a, re- we have a need for... Uh, law enforcement and investigative agencies, Definitely. and we all, of course, want to be protected. I want to be clear about that. Sure. And that there are a lot of very fine people who sign up to work in these places and That's do their right. best. That's right. I'm yes. friends with a bunch of people who we went into too. them we with, their, you know, with, with, with their, their hand over their heart and were had their heart broken you That's know, right. and left because it wasn't what they were told that it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And and so this is just a basic problem. And, and you know, um, uh, human nature is human nature, and if you think that people, because they're wearing a badge or a uniform, are inherently somehow more noble uh, than the rest of us, I mean, you're you're kidding yourself. True, that's absolutely true. So, I just have one more question, Russ, and then we have to get going. But why do you do this? Why do I do this? Yeah. I'm off my rocker now. <laughs> <laughs> I, do this, I do this because somebody's got to do it. Yeah. I mean, I'm serious. You know, I just, that's the kind of person I am. You know, it's, look, some of us, you know, you, you, you see that, uh, there's a, some glass thing in the street and a car's about to hit it and you leave it there, right? And then some people go, you know what? <laughs> somebody's going to hit that thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you yeah. go over and you yeah. pick it up. Or somebody sees that somebody's child is in danger or whatever. I mean, yeah. look, we're all constituted differently. I, I'm not a hero or something, but I mean, I, I sort of just see a need here. And it's a, you know, truth is a great cleansing agent. It's a, it's, it's kind of, it's also kind of a cool thing. And, you know, I like what I'm doing and our whole team at Hua Hawaii love doing this. And, you know, we feel passionate about our country and about all the values we have been told are so important. The ironic thing, guys, is that all this stuff at these, you know, rallies about Officer Collier is that very, very cynical people are using good values to sell people on a lie. True. Yeah. And we want to just advocate for those values and tell people on the truth. That's it. That's it. And who, what, why, dot org. Um, l- speaking of the last questions related to what, <laughs> following up on, and, and it's really is, follow- is this your last question or yeah. your last, this last is, question? This is my last question. <laughs> okay. And it's a follow up on Frank's, too. Uh, it's real quick. Do you, you, you know, I know that you're. You know why you do and what you're doing now, but do you still write for some of these places like New York Times or Village Voice, or are you exclusively now just at who what why dot org? 
I really don't have the time to write for any of these other places. I'm not saying I won't do it in the future. It might be fun to dip back into the world of glossy magazines and what have you. Hey, did you guys see the uh, profile of us in Boston Magazine? Yes, I did. did. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I this, thought. This yeah. month's issue. Yeah, I yeah, loved yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I love uh, that. Boston Globe also, you know, quoted me. And I mean, they're starting to pay attention, you know. So, they yeah, should. I mean, we'd love to kind of, you know, keep our bona fides and dip our foot into the so called, uh, you know, establishment uh, media uh, uh, because, you know, they do good things too and um they like us and we like them uh, you know as much as as much as possible but uh, right now um i and our team are putting all of our energy into building what we hope will be the the best news organization in the country and you know maybe one of the best anywhere excellent well thank you so much today russ for being here and calling in and spending so much time with us we hope to uh hear from you soon again following up especially on this uh as a sarnoff case continues on uh it's been delayed now but you know you know it's going to be starting up again um we we would love to have you back on again thank you, you russ you, you bet we'd be happy to do it thank you very much have a good night russ thank you we are the young jerks on wemf radio that was good yeah that was awesome it was a, we had a long talk but we really like cool. covered a lot yeah, we and did we, we we covered a whole lot of ground a lot that of was, information yeah was a, good, a lot of information there it was good He's yeah, good, to go too, isn't he? That, yeah. that cast again. Yeah, yeah, no, he was super good. It's super like we jumped point. down the rabbit hole, but we got a serious guy who, who knows his facts. Yeah, right. I mean, he recalls better than we do, even Frankie. with this clipboards just of really, truth on the way down the rabbit hole. This guy's like, been clues. doing it for how many years? Decades. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I would definitely check out his book. I, I, I've seen excerpts. I've read some excerpts online of the family of secrets of uh, the Bush dynasty, America's invisible government, and the hidden history of the last 50 years. I really got to read this book because uh, it's right up my alley and... and he was amazing today. Yeah, he's got a bunch of actually really cool um, like talks on YouTube, too. Yeah, check him out. Um, I was watching him at work today. So look him up. His name's <laughs> Russ Baker, right? Russ yeah. Baker. Russ Baker, yeah. author of uh, Secret Families as well as the uh, Family, Family of Secrets. Family of Secrets. And then uh, check out whowhatwhy.org. Awesome. And uh, we are the Young Jerks, and we're going to take a quick break and maybe take your phone calls if you want to weigh in on uh, the discussion we're having today, 617-500-7100.